you know, if I think like many of you, if you had asked me at Thanksgiving what I would be doing today, uh, the narrative would be quite different than what has actually happened. The plan was to be uh, on leave in France for teaching at the College de France. And quite honestly, um, over the last year, I had decided to turn my back on the last 20 years of work on viruses. And, um, you know, like for all of us, I think this is a defining, kind of confusing, unsettling episode in our lives. And what I'm going to tell you about today is what has happened to me over the last six weeks. I've been trying to come to terms with a lot of friends and collaborators uh, with the coronavirus pandemic. So why am I talking to you about viruses? So when I moved to Caltech in uh, the year 2000, the provost at that time, um, Steve Coonan, he suggested to me that I get in touch with Doug Reese uh, because I had said I was gonna leave my past in condensed matter physics and try to start working on biology. And, and Steve was a little skeptical and thought that Doug would be a great uh, friend and advisor and he was right about that. And what happened in that, about that time is that there was a paper from UC Berkeley by a guy named Carlos Bustamante. And in this paper, what they described was truly an astonishing experiment where they held on to a single virus and they also held on to a single piece of viral DNA. And then they watched as the virus packed the DNA inside of the virus. And the analogy that I like is to think of 500 meters worth of Golden Gate Bridge cable and putting it in the back of a FedEx truck. So those are the right dimensions. Those are the right stiffnesses for the, the DNA relative to the, the size of the truck. And, um, and what they claimed in this press release is that the DNA inside of the virus is packed so tightly that we should think of the pressure as being something like 10 times that in a champagne bottle. So I found that very intriguing and it led to, I'd say 15 years of work in my lab. And I just wanna highlight one of the pieces of work that was done by um, current Caltech professor, Dave Van Dalen and Dave Wu and Hannah Tucson and some others, where what Dave did in his PhD thesis was a beautiful experiment in which he was able to watch one individual virus infect one individual cell. And I'm gonna show you a movie of that. So what you see on the right-hand side is a, is a bacterium outlined. That's the outline you, that you see. And then the bright object is a virus. And so when I hit play, what you're seeing over time is a single DNA molecule being shot into the, into the bacterium, which is now infected. And what will happen is, let's say 20 minutes later, that uh, virus, will, the virus will have created two or 300 new viruses and the bacterium will explode and those viruses will be released to go do their deed elsewhere. So that's kind of my background. So why, why are we having this chat? Well, as we all know by now, um, we're, uh, the way I would put it is really we're living in the, the pandemic era. And um, the, the pandemic idea is nothing new, despite the claim that uh, no one saw this coming. And there have been very major pandemics over the last 100 years. And we've been living through one since the early 1980s, which is, is monumental, the HIV uh, pandemic. But the coronavirus uh, pandemic that we're currently living through has been foreshadowed already twice. And I'm a bit ashamed to say that even though I remember the, uh, the Air Canada flight arriving, arriving in Toronto in 2002 with the infected passenger, I just didn't somehow catch on. So at any rate, that's sort of the negative side of the ledger. On the positive side of the ledger, I have to say in all earnestness that in my whole life, I have never seen a coming together of scientists uh, willing and ready to, to act uh, on short notice and retool their labs. And here I show you two examples. Um, one of them is Manu Prakash at Stanford. And uh, I've been interacting with him through the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub. And he's been doing creative things like repurposing uh, snorkeling masks, like the, the one that you see on the right, and using three-dimensional printing to actually use these for protective equipment for health workers. And then Pamela that you see, Pamela Bjorkman that you see on the lower right, has been working on HIV and uh, she and her uh, postdoc Christopher Barnes and other lab members have been doing really interesting studies, again, repurposing on short order to think about the coronavirus. And so what's my point? My point is that um, it's, it's very interesting to see the, the way that the life of the mind has really risen to the occasion for so many people. So what I'm going to try to argue today is that SARS-CoV-2 is not just a word story, but it's also a numbers story. And what I mean by that is that there are many numbers about viruses that matter to us, that have actual life and death consequences. And they're also scientifically fascinating. So for example, knowing the infection probability is of great urgency. 
understanding what fraction of the population is asymptomatic is incredibly interesting and was indeed um, something that, that came up. Uh, sorry, uh, the next one is the one I wanted to mention. The fraction of people harboring antibodies is another one that's key and was, that's the, the, was on the headlines of the LA Times this morning. So there's many numbers that matter, and I'm going to pass through them along the way. And then at the bottom, I'm going to try and make an argument that whether we like it or not, people are using predictive mechanics models of the viral pandemic to try to think about what to do next. And I will end on that note. So why by the numbers? I, I think that Charles Darwin had this best in his autobiography when he referred to people that used mathematics as having an extra sense. And up at the top, I give you two examples that I find particularly excellent. And there's probably people on the call actually that traveled with me on a Caltech alumni trip to New Zealand to see the birds that I'm going to speak of, which are the bar-tailed godwits. These birds actually carry out a 10,000 uh, kilometer migration nonstop. It takes them 10 days. And you can work out on the basis of simple ideas about drag. And this is something actually that Dave Stevenson um, and I have done in Phys 11. Uh, Dave did this within the last few months, actually, where he tried to work out the the uh, drag on an airplane, and we then segued into the question of birds. On the right, you see the question of uh, how does the radius of a leg scale with the size of the animal? And that goes like R to the fourth power, the radius of the fourth power. And this is something that started already in the hands of Galileo very, very long ago. And there are many such questions also about, uh, about viruses. So I'm not claiming at all that the by the numbers approach is the exclusive way to go after biological problems, but it's like having an extra microscope. So my talk uh, will go something like this. I want to start out by describing the, the virus itself, viruses writ large, and then specified to the coronavirus. And then I'll have a few comments about the scale of individual humans. And then I'll try to finish up with some notions of how the pandemic is moving across the earth and what are the, what are the consequences of that? How can we think about it from the modeling point of view? And what are the social consequences? So to start out, I guess I just want to point out and remind everybody, something not surprising at all at this point, but viruses are just one kind of pathogen. And what I like on, in this figure on the right is it gives you a, a by length scales organized view of different kinds of pathogens. For example, at the top, I remember as a kid even being kind of freaked out about the idea that there could be these huge worms that could be inside of your digestive tract. And note that this scale goes all the way down to 10 to the minus 8 meters or 10 nanometers for the, the um, polio virus. But before I really get into viruses, I want to just review a little bit about the history of epidemiology and how we came to know about pathogens. And I want to use cholera as a way to tell that story. So in teaching by one um, four years or so ago, one of the main topics that I liked talking about was biogeography. And in that time, we talked about the relatively recent earthquake in Haiti. And probably many of you remember that there was, for the first time in 100 years, a cholera epidemic in Haiti, which is now there all the time. And um, so there have been a number of cholera pandemics over the years. And the, the original work that led to really understanding what was going on was done by John Snow. He was a British uh, scientist and medical doctor, and he was really interested in the question of what, what led to the cholera epidemic in uh, London in the 1850s. And his point of view was sort of colored by a, a hypothesis that he rejected. So people thought that cholera was transported in the air through, through what was called the miasma hypothesis, uh, an unspecified causative agent. He, was, he rejected that because the, the thought was that the symptoms were really that people were having diarrhea to the tune of something like uh, a liter per hour, and that didn't seem to be consistent with a res respiratory tract infection. So what he did was to go around London and try and understand uh, the red histogram shows you the number of deaths as a function of locale, and then he tried to figure out where people were getting their water. And the significance of this is that he was able to deduce or infer that it was likely the Broad Street uh, water pump. And I am always intrigued by this also because there were some outliers. There were features of the story that didn't initially make sense. And you know that's the world that we live in. That's the world of science and the real world outside of science. And he, in the end, was able to understand, for example, that an older lady that was quite far away, she liked the taste of the water from that pump. And so she had sent a family member with a bucket to get water from there. And unfortunately, they all died. On the other hand, there were some brewery workers who didn't get sick, and it turned out that they had, were given free beer and so on. 
So the picture that emerged was one of uh, a monster soup, something that was kind of already figured out by Anthony van Leeuwenhoek, the great Dutch microscopist in the 1600s, when he turned his very tiny microscope to the analysis of all of his own bodily fluids and also the water of Delft. And what he sound, found was what he referred to as very many animal, pretty animalcules, very prettily moving, a, a really charming expression. So this was, in a certain sense, right prior to the emergence of the so-called germ theory of disease in the hands of Pasteur and Koch. Pasteur having been called in by the breweries, for example, because there was contamination in their beer and also wineries. And this led him to actually figure out that there was contamination in the form of microbes. This led him, in turn, to speculate that maybe human health was the result of a similar contamination. He and Koch both uh, aggressively pursued cholera ac across the globe, starting in Egypt. Some of their students actually died. And, um, and the same was true, I must say, for there's a recent paper in Science by a part of Sabeti, if I remember correctly, in which she and her grad students were looking at Ebola. And, and you know, if you look at the end of the paper, there were several of the grad students that actually died. It's a very serious endeavor that people are undertaking. And out of this emerged what Koch but what Koch uh, thought of as the way that one should be able to establish that one had found the causative agent. These are sometimes known as Koch's postulates. I'm gonna go pa past them rather quickly, just as a preface to the idea of viruses. So the notion is that you need to be able to harvest the relevant microorganism from the infected organism, then to culture and grow it up, take those cultured microorganisms and reinfect a second animal, and it should once again lead to the same uh, medical consequences, and then you ought to be able to harvest them again. So this brings us to, let's say, 1890. At that time, we still didn't know about viruses. And the way that viruses came onto the scene, in part, was because of a similar story to that of Pasteur. So it turns out that a Russian, Dmitry Ivanovsky, and also a, a Dutch guy, Martin, Martinez Beyerink, had been contacted by tobacco growers who had noticed a blight of uh, their plants. And what they did as good bacteriologists was to use very small filters to try to filter out the causative agent. What was interesting that they found was that even though they used these very small filters, the fluid that passed through was still infectious. And so the conclusion was that there was a new kind of pathogen that was not a microorganism in the conventional sense. And so if you look at Byerink's papers, you'll see that he posited, you know, he didn't call it a virus at that point, but he posited this new infectious agent. And I just wanted to say, you know, we could spend an hour talking about the history of tobacco and mosaic virus, an amazing episode in the history of science. I, at the very least, wanted to call your attention to this work in the 1950s at Berkeley by uh, Frankel Conrad. What they did is they purified the proteins for the tobacco mosaic virus and the RNA molecules, and then they put them in a test tube. And what you see on the lower right is electron microscopy images of the vi virus particles, but they're actually, as you can see, imperfect. They don't all have the same length. And what they ended up learning is that these, just the protein alone was not infectious. And when they actually put the RNA in as well, the viruses were all the same length at roughly 300 nanometers, and they were infectious. And in the end, if you like, the beautiful idea is that the RNA serves as a tape measure that determines the, link, the, the, the free energy minimizing length of these virus particles. A really interesting story. So the, 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 if, in my way of thinking, the tobacco mosaic virus has kind of been the hydrogen atom of the subject of virology. So that kind of brings us up to the, the question of what is a virus. So what has been discovered over the last uh, 100 years is all sorts of interesting things about various viruses. Um, if I had more time, I would tell you about the classification known as the Baltimore classification in honor of David Baltimore. And um, it's a very useful way to think about the organization of genomes. But for my purposes, I'm going to take a sort of coarser view and just urge you to consider two broad classes of viruses, either those that have RNA as their genetic material or those that have DNA as their genetic material. And as you can see in the lower half of the, of the left side, coronavirus is an RNA virus, and I'll come back to that in a little while. So viruses are beautiful. They have all sorts of different shapes and sizes. I've already told you about the tobacco mosaic virus, which is this helical cylinder. The adenovirus that you see in the second column is this beautiful icosahedron, and you know it's worth talking about why 
do viruses adopt icosahedral structures, but that's for another day. The influenza virus that you see next is a bit more heterogeneous. And then finally on the right hand side is probably my personal favorite because of the sort of sophisticated nature of these viral uh, capsids is uh, bacteriophage. Now, one of the things that's very important to me about my life in science is not so much the facts of science. In fact, it was mentioned that um, the way I got into science, if you'd asked me on April 30th, 1977 in the morning, what I thought of science, I thought it was another belief system colored by authoritarian figures. I mean, that's what I, my high school self thought and I hated it. And what I learned that evening from my, my friend's dad was how Eratosthenes had figured out the, the radius of the earth. And what I learned at that point was science as a methodology for generating knowledge, not as a series of various facts. And so it's very important to ask how we know things. And so, you know, electron microscopy is one of the ways that we know about viruses. Another way that's absolutely amazing is the use of X-ray crystallography. So, you know, if you go up to San Francisco, uh, if you sit on a left-hand window seat from flight from Burbank, um, when, you're, when you're coming into SFO on the left-hand side, you'll see Stanford. And if you look cl closely, you'll also see the Stanford Linear Accelerator. And at the end of it, you'll see basically a bunch of, um, a bunch of buildings and they actually harvest radiation from those accelerated particles to shine X-rays and basically measure the atomic positions of proteins. And so we know with exquisite atomic detail the structures of these things. So given that background, let me just make a few comments about the coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2, and also influenza. So one of the things that we hear and have heard over the last six weeks is just another flu or it's a flu or something like that. And you know, I feel offended by that because of my bizarre love affair with influenza. You know, if you look on the right-hand side, you'll see that influenza has eight separate RNA molecules on its interior, whereas uh, SARS-CoV-2 on the left it has one long, um, roughly 30,000 nucleotide long um, um, genome, RNA. They are comparable in size, I'll give you that. So just to remind everyone of the meaning of nanometers, if I tell you that the viruses are about 100 nanometers across, uh, just to remind you that a human hair is roughly 50 microns across, so that would take 50 bacteria back to back to equal that width, and it would take roughly 10 viruses back to back to equal the width of one bacterium. So let's say, for the sake of argument, that about 500 viruses stacked up against each other give you about the width of a human hair. So what's inside of the viral container? I've already mentioned, there's either RNA or DNA. And what I wanna say about that is, you know, if we had been living in the year 1665 in England, as was the young Isaac Newton, what we would know at this point is that there was, there was a disease ravaging our society we would have no idea really what it was, what the causative agent was. We wouldn't know where it was going and where it was coming and when it would end. We wouldn't basically know anything. And I just marvel at the fact that in the last four months, uh, we've added thousands, literally thousands of entries into the genomic encyclopedia in the sense that the sequence of many, many SARS-CoV-2 viruses are known. And so, um, so let me just give you a little bit of a sense of this. So I've shown a sort of miniaturized version of the virus, which is 100 nanometers across. And then I've indicated here schematically the size of the genome itself. And the simple way to calculate how long it is is just to remember that the distance between bases is about a third of a nanometer per nucleotide. And this thing has a 30,000 nucleotide long genome, hence it's 10,000 nanometers or 10 microns. So it's very long in comparison with the size of the capsid. And you know, you should actually think by analogy with your own cells, we have a few times 10 to the 13 cells in our bodies. And in each, in each of our cells, with the, some exceptions, we have about two meters worth of DNA packed inside of a nucleus, which is less than five microns in diameter. So you know, it's a comparable compaction problem. And I'm not gonna talk about that further, although it's deeply interesting how it is that such a long object gets inside of the virus. And it's, it's one of the great questions of physical virology, if you will, which is what are the forces that lead to the assembly of viruses? Something really, really worth thinking about. So I wanted to comment on the evolution of viruses as a general idea. So the, the evolution of molecules in general has been used now for 60 years almost as a molecular clock, going back to work done, for example, at Caltech by Zucker, Candle, and Pauling. 
uh, on hemoglobin. And so we, we have a well-established form, formulation of the idea of mutations in clocks. And what I'm showing you here is with these little circles is the idea that the coronavirus, as it evolves, it actually acquires mutations, which are labeled by these different colors. Now, one of the most interesting things about this particular virus is um, one of my truly favorite subjects in biology, which is that it has a proofreading function. So what I mean by that is, uh, is given by the following analogy, sort of a Las Vegas-like analogy. When the genome is being copied, it has to reproduce the sequence of letters, which I show you in the top left. And the way I want you to think of that is that every time a nucleotide is copied, a very dishonest coin is flipped. If the coin comes up heads, you get the correct copy. And if it comes up tails, you don't. The, the head has a, a probability that's a million fold higher than the probability of a tails. So it's a very, very uh, high fidelity copying process. And part of the reason for that is that there's this proofreading function, meaning that there's an enzyme whose job it is to take surveillance and to make sure that the wrong nucleotide has not been incorporated and to fix it if it is. And what I show you on the right is just a graph that illustrates what happens when this proofreading function is knocked out. And in that case, the mutation rate is increased substantially. So one of the things that I would recommend that people take a look at if you have time is the so-called Next Strain website. And the reason I like looking at it is because it gives a sense of the passage of the virus across the globe with these mutations serving as a clock, if you like, and also as a geographical footprint or a fingerprint. It tells you, oh, this particular uh, virus has its roots in China or Europe or so on. So that's the, that's the way that people have been able to formulate these kinds of maps. So that's kind of my background on the virus. Now what I want to do is talk about the infection of individual humans. So there's many ways that viruses can invade the human body and other, other uh, animals as well. So there's the respiratory route, there's the digestive tract, there's the reproductive tract, you could get bitten by a dog. And in this case, we're going to focus on the res respiratory route. So one of the things that people have been talking a lot about, if you've been reading the newspaper or listening to the news, you know, obviously we're practicing uh, what I guess we now call physical distancing. And there's a lot of beautiful work that has to do with understanding the nature of the distribution of particle sizes that come out of our mouths, both when I'm talking like I am right now, or if I sneeze or if I cough, there's high speed photography with a million frames per second that has been used to track these uh, particles and to measure how long they survive. And again, speaking of Phys 11 and Dave Stevenson, um, a few months back, he did a really fun calculation about the recent Delta flight that dumped its fuel over, um, over South Central Los Angeles and why the, the altitude of the pilot and the plane was uh, a, a significant factor in determining whether or not there were they were still droplets upon arrival at, at um, ground level. So there's a lot of, as I said, there's a lot of thinking about this stuff. Another class of measurements that I show you here, and I give you the reference in case you want to look up the paper, is the, the survivability of virus in various environments. So this paper actually has a way of measuring the so-called titer of viable viruses. So on the y-axis, you see on a log scale, the number of viable viruses in some units that I don't really want to explain, unless somebody wants to talk about it later. And then the x-axis is time scale as measured in hours. Um, on the bottom, they produce aerosols. So they have a way of aerosolizing the viruses. And then once again, they ask the question over time, what's the survival? Um, and you know, these are the kinds of things that are related to questions of infection. Um, it's really hard to come by data, in fact, that's in absolute units about the infectious dose, if you like. It's one of the things that people are talking about and thinking about a lot both in terms of, of dose and also in terms of viral load inside of a given um, patient. So what I did on the left was just to try to calculate for you, given the measured viral loads in patients, for example, at UCSF, which is something like 10 to the fourth to 10 to the eighth viruses per ml, um, you could calculate that that would mean there would be anywhere between a few to a few times 10 to the fourth viruses per 100 micron droplet. And what I show you on the right is for polio, um, between two and 20 viruses suffices for uh, a, an infectious dose. And with influenza, it's between 500 and 300. And I want to, at the very least, 
uh, uh, suggest that it's worth our while to think about other analogous cases, like how many photons can be seen by a photoreceptor? How many molecules does it re is, are required to uh, induce the, the perception of an odor? Or if I'm a bacterium looking around for food, what's the smallest gradient that can be detected? All of these are questions about receptors interacting with a, a ligand of some sort. So what happens once the virus in, enters our bodies? This is a oversimplified, in fact, I should have said this at the beginning as a disclaimer. Um, although I'm, I'm passionate about this subject, I'm really a beginner for one thing, and there's just way too much to know writ, writ large. And the second point is in a talk of this style, obviously I have to cut some corners. And, and if you want to know more, I can certainly point you to reading to, to try and learn more about these things. So the life history, if you like, the first step shown on the lower left is the virus binding onto a, a certain receptor known as base two, and it gets internalized and releases its genome. The cell is now hereby basically hijacked, much like a Trojan horse releasing the soldiers. New proteins are made. Those proteins assemble on certain cellular organelles like the ER. The virus assembles through a process that I would love to spend time talking about. In other words, how does the RNA get inside and what's the nature of the free energy interactions that lead to this? And then new viruses are released. So there's a lot of talk about testing. Um, today, I uh, at noon, watched Governor Newsom talking about testing, and it's, it's a subject that's on everybody's minds all the time uh, in both a good and bad way from the standpoint of how, how well the tests are working. I just wanted to indicate roughly for people um, what's, what's one of the ways that this is pursued is by uh, using the so-called polymerase chain reaction where one amplifies um, the DNA that comes from taking the viral RNA and turning it into DNA. And then what's shown at the lower curve is the viral load as a function of time. And this is going to come up later when I talk about infectiousness and some ideas for how to end the lockdown sensibly. Another way that people uh, do, want to do testing and are doing testing, and you know, it's on the headlines of today's LA Times, is through the use of antibodies. So schematically, what I'm showing you here is that you take a blood sample. In that blood sample, people have, if they've been infected, they have antibodies against the virus. On the upper right, what I'm showing is this idea that you take proteins, the spike protein, for example, from the virus, and you paint them on a microscope cover slip, for example, and then you flow the blood across this, and the antibodies, if they're specific, they will bind to the, uh, the spike protein. And then you can have a secondary antibody that's connected to an enzyme that allows you to read out, quote unquote, the presence of the antibodies of interest. And often, this is a yes, no question, but it's even more interesting when it's a quantitative question, which is the sort of thing that people in, in Pamela Bjorkman's lab are doing. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close now by um, just talking a little bit about the passage of the virus at the scale of the Earth. So the first thing I want to say is that we live in a viral world, and I'm going to prove that from a by-the-numbers perspective. So if you go out into the ocean, which people have done, and you collect a sample, let's say a cubic centimeter of water from the top 200 uh, meters of the ocean, on average, let's say you'll find something like uh, 5 million bacteria and you'll find about 50 million viruses. And in general, there is this notion of the so-called virus to bacterium ratio. And the rule of thumb is that it's roughly 10 to 1. If you take the 70 gigatons of carbon that's tied up in bacteria on planet Earth, that corresponds to about 5 times 10 to the 29th bacteria total. And so if we have a tenfold excess of bacteriophage, that means there's on the order of 5 times 10 to the 30th bacteriophage on planet Earth. Even as I said earlier, in an infected patient, you will have in one ml of um, the sample, something like between 10 to the fourth and 10 to the eighth virus particles. So it's really important that I try to give a little bit of an impression of the role of models in what's going on around us. And when I say what's going on around us, I'm not talking about you know, at the level of the scientists that are thinking hard about these problems, but I'm talking about the level of what you see on the evening news or on the press releases or on the daily um, the press conferences of our governors and so on. So the thing that I want to pass along is, you know, this is now me giving my personal spin and 
and it's a spin that I feel very strongly about with respect to the subject of biology. And that is that I think we have entered the era where the, the sort of quantitative demands being placed on the subject are being increased. And, um, and so, uh, hold on a sec, just one moment. So make sure I'm not missing something important. Um, okay. So, um, so what, I, what I wanted to say is Galileo has this wonderful quote about the language of the universe being written in the language of mathematics. We can debate that later. But the thing I want to say is that there are a number of different thing, ideas passing around in the community at large. And for example, when, um, when the two doctors that stand by President Trump's side get up and talk at the podium, one of the models that they have in mind is the one I'm showing you at the lower left. And this is from the University of Washington crew of Chris Murray, and it's based on using a so-called error function. And if you like, it's fundamentally a fit. In the upper graph, I show you, you know, just exponential growth, which is shown in red, and then logistic growth, which is shown in blue. And that's another class of empirical model that people are trying to use in order to, for example, figure out the total cumulative number of cases or deaths or, or whatever the case may be. On the right-hand side are a class of models which I'll refer to as, in, as mechanistic. And the idea of those models is to try to imagine the population as divided up into different categories. So some subset of people are susceptible and then some subset of people are infected and some subset of people are recovered. That's the top one. And the next one is some subset are symptomatic and then exposed and then infected and maybe they're, they're not, not symptomatic or they are and then they become re uh, recovered. And, all of these different models lead to predictions about the population as a function of time. And for example, when you hear about flattening the curve, it's the yellow curve in my top graph on the right that's being talked about, trying to bring down the number of infected people so as not to exceed the capacity of our, um, our intensive care units, for example. So there's a really interesting paper that's going to be put out on the archive tonight. We're living in a very weird era where papers can appear one day and they can on the, the preprint archives and they can appear on the front pages of our newspapers the following day. Um, I find that incredibly troubling, to be perfectly honest. But this paper will appear tonight by Pankaj Mehta and, and Bobby Marcelin. And I think it's the most careful job that I'm aware of thus far where people are basically trying to understand and do the forecasting on the basis of the kind of empirical models that are being used by the University of Washington group. These guys are very clever, and one of their cl little clever insights was to use a log-log plot. So to plot log not only of the number of people, but also log of number of days um, uh, since, since the beginning of the pandemic, or since, the, since let's say, one case or five cases or something. And, um, and in fact, we made a bet this morning about whether or not in the long run, Florida is gonna be correct because I'm, I'm skeptical of it. For those of you that care about little details, um, one of the subtleties of the data, so this is more just as, a, as a, to whet people's appetite and maybe to inspire somebody that wants to talk to me about it later. Um, the early stages are exponential, but then the, the parts, the sort of second part that you see in these curves is what's called power law growth. And to capture all of that is, is actually subtle. Um, so I've already mentioned this, this model, so I don't think I'll, I'll repeat it, other than to say that you know, these are the classes of models that people are thinking about. So again, to reiterate, there's on the left side, there's just sort of empirical fits. The right-hand side, you might say sort of physics-based or mechanistic-based or chemistry-based models where you write down equations from first principles, quote unquote. You have to work out what the parameters are. And all of those are informing the way people are thinking about the pandemic. So in the early stages, as I just mentioned, there's exponential growth. And to understand that, I like the story of the emperor who had a favor done by somebody and offered this person uh, a reward of some sort. And the person said, I would like to have one grain of wheat on the first square of the chessboard, two grains on the next, and so on and so forth. And to give you a sense of the power of this, if we were to take in the laboratory that I have at Caltech and uh, the bacteria that we grow, and if we were to let them grow um, uninhibited in the tubes that they grow in, in less than a week, they would have the, a mass greater than that of the earth. And that's really the power of exponential growth. So I didn't really update this. So this is already outdated, but this is just to show you basically over the last two or three weeks, what's been going on on the Johns Hopkins website 
And the lower right of these um, diagrams shows you the growth profiles over time in terms of cumulative, sorry, total number of cases. So these models are used, again, to try to make predictions about the dynamics of the infection. And I'm going to come back to this a little bit um, just before ending. So I wanted to, before stopping, just give you a few thoughts about what I'm going to call social dynamics. So, um, so one of the things that, that I think is very interesting, and it's related to many, many different pieces of this, is, for example, the way that our shelves have been emptied of toilet paper or of um, some fresh fruits and things like that. And um, also the, the possible over demand on intensive care units. And the theorem that I wanted to sort of illustrate is called Little's theorem. And it's, it's a simple idea. And I'm going to use Caltech to illustrate it. So in, in part, part B, I show you the relationship between the rate of influx or exit, the student body size, and the time in college. So if we take 800 students, divide by four years, I give us a rate of matriculation and a rate of graduation, let's hope, of 200 per year. This kind of thinking can be used to figure out the steady state supply of a Trader Joe's. Before the pandemic, they have it nailed. They know how much toilet paper, how much tomato sauce, how much tuna, how many honey-coated co almonds that they need. And um, so the rate of arrival and the rate of exit is the same. But the, the point is, is that the, the demands which we've been able to see, and there's very interesting data that's being curated and thought about by our Caltech undergrads in the Data Science Club, um, can tell you about this, about intensive care units. So if you take a picture of the LA area and you think about the typical distance between hospitals, it's roughly five miles. This will lead you to the conclusion that there's roughly 200 hospitals. Of course, you can look it up, but I think it's more fun to estimate it. The number of beds per hospital is roughly 200. It ranges between like 75 and 600 or something. That tells you there's roughly 40,000 beds in the LA area. 10 million people roughly competing for those beds leaves you with uh, 200 people assigned to each bed. And um, as we know from visiting the emergency room under just normal circumstances, you usually have a wait and some fraction of the beds are occupied. And we already know from looking at videos of places like New York and Italy, what happens when that capacity is exceeded. I also wanted to comment on the surge of, uh, of deaths. And um, there too, it's a simple estimate. If you take the population of the United States, let's call it 330 million people, and divide by a, an average lifetime of let's call it 70 years, That'll tell you the average birth or death rate in the U.S. is around 4.5 million per year. That's actually too high. It's more like 3 million. But I can figure out what fraction of that uh, death rate is in New York City, and it's a couple of hundred people per day. And I'm not going to have time to go into it, but if you look at the LA Times, or sorry, New York Times website this morning, and I can also show you our own graphs that um, were made by Rachel Banks, um, there's quite an excess actually over 2019 and above the reported numbers. So, you know, if there's a thousand people dying per day, it's really quite a bit above the, the average. So I wanted to finish with a few thoughts about ending the lockdown. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell you about two papers out of the huge number of papers that have been coming out. There's literally thousands of them that I think in some ways represent the smartest thinking that I've become aware of in uh, the recent month and a half. So one of them is from a Swiss group, and their idea has to do, to do with the use of random testing, not random antibody testing, but random testing of people that are currently infected. And the idea is simply stated, and I wanna use an analogy, which is their analogy. If I were an Airbnb owner and I came into my house once every two weeks and adjusted the thermostat based on how it feels at that moment, that'd be a pretty lousy way to control the temperature. On the other hand, if I'm taking, keeping track of the temperature every day, I can be much more fine in my adjustments of the temperature in my house. So what they did is they calculated, and we're not talking about like the kind of order of magnitude calculations I've done for you today. We're talking about really careful, thoughtful science. They, they worked out how a regimen of daily testing to the tune in, in Switzerland of 15,000 people per day, chosen randomly, not followed, they're not following anybody, how by doing this, they can actually, um, they can measure the growth rate. And it's not, it's not the instantaneous single day test that's the key point. It's the day after day and the resulting slope that's used as the basis of deciding whether it's time to go into a short uh, 
lockdown in order to beat down the growth rate again. The second idea that I want to tell you about is from some, uh, some Israelis who have a scheme that's complementary to the one I just told you about. It's not, it's not uh, either, either or. And this one is very smart because it uses the virus against itself. So what's the idea? The idea is shifting to a scheme to emerge from the lockdown of four days on work and 10 days off with two groups. So on week one, everybody in uh, group one, and that would mean everybody in, in a given household would go to work. You go to work for four days, and let's say you work for 10 or 12 hours. And, um, and the point of this is that even if you get infected at the first moment that you go back to work, the latent period of the virus is between three and four days. What this means is that you will not have become infectious until you are yourself under lockdown, you and your family members. So now group one is under lockdown for 10 days. Group two on the following Monday goes to work and they're at work for four days. And during that time, again, if somebody's infected, they're in the latent period, they're not infectious. And they then under lockdown, if they become, in, if they get symptoms, they'll know it. If they don't get symptoms, it won't matter because by the time they're through with their lockdown, they will no longer be infectious when they go back to work. The graph that's shown up on top gives you an indication of the number of cases over time. You see that it's oscillatory, but decaying. And this is a, it's a very interesting idea. Um, we had a discussion about it today. And, um, and for sure, social scientists have things, smart things to say about this. And I'm not commenting on that part, whether or not it's implementable. Um, but, um, but that's it. I'm about to stop. So let me just conclude by saying there's certain key numbers that we're missing. And um, I think all of them matter. And without those numbers and without the investment in infrastructure to actually get the mechanics right, the predictions are, are going to continue to be not as good as we would hope them to be. So what was learned? I gave you an overview of the virus, the scale of individual humans, and, and the propagation on uh, planet Earth. We've tried very hard to, to know things about this virus as represented in this paper, which you can all take a look at if you want. And, um, and I think I'll just stop there by um, saying it's been a, a great 20-year adventure um, with Ron Milo and my physical biology, the cell co-authors, as we've tried to think about uh, biology by the numbers.